Uh, so welcome to uh, the LUG. Uh, if you're new here, or even if you aren't, uh, feel free to introduce yourself. I'm Andy Denner. I guess I'm still somehow the president. Uh, at some point, we probably should have an election, but until then, uh, yeah. So uh, I work uh, by day for a large North American seed corn company that uh, used to rhyme with Smyonier. Uh And uh, yeah, by night I play with Linux, and also by day now I play a little bit with uh, Python and C Sharp and high performance computing uh, uh, in the IBM stack and sort of stuff like that. So. Uh, Anyone else uh, who's either new or uh, semi-new or just wants to talk? Well, I know I sent out the invite to quite a few people. So, hi. Um, I think even my dad is here. I think that's Tom. <laughs> Trying to see. And uh, the, a lot of plug people got um, definitely uh, signed up to <clears throat> enjoy a plug meeting because ours was a general discussion yesterday that wasn't very well organized. <laughs> So, so I guess I'm not technically new because I may have, I think I hopped in for about 10 minutes for the last meeting. Um, so I'm Walt Mankowski. I am, um, I guess, the organizer of Plug, mo mostly because the people that used to do it kind of, like they said, oh, you want to help out? And then they kind of disappeared. And um, so, you know, I'm, I'm sort of running, the, like at least in charge of setting up the meetings now. Um, and I work, uh, I work for, for uh, Penn Medicine, um, which is uh, in Philadelphia. Um, the, we've been like really busy, although I'm in radiology, which is not um, super affected by um, COVID-19 stuff, but I, yeah, sort of adjacent to everything that's been going on, which has been interesting. Um, we do um, uh, models of breast and lung cancer and try to, um, predict who are like, which cases are likely to be the uh, more severe cases based on, on models of how things turn out. Um, so it's kind of interesting, interesting stuff there. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's me. Can I go next? Sure. Yeah, hi, yeah. I'm Adam. Uh, like Walt, I'm uh, with Plug. Uh, I came over because I, uh, had seen Will mention uh, mention Kubernetes at a couple uh, couple plug meetings in the past. Um, I, I, I work. I'm a Red Hat certified system administrator. I work in uh, financial services. I'm a Linux sysadmin uh, in suburban Philadelphia, and we're implementing uh, Kubernetes at work. And it looks like we're going with Rancher. So hopefully, Will has a few things to say say about that. And um, my daily driver distro is Fedora 31, but, but I mostly use uh, CentOS 7 at work. And uh, glad to see I, uh, uh, another lug for the first time. I've been I've been in and around Iowa a bunch of times, not in a few years, but uh, um, seems like you have a pretty cool group here. So looking forward to seeing you present. For a complete opposite, this was my first lug before coming out to uh, Pennsylvania or coming back back from Iowa to Pennsylvania um, after college. So welcome. This. <laughs> My my first uh, lug was actually off Ugit, up in Ames, for the Ames Area Free Unix Group. Uh, I was really disappointed a couple years after that when they changed their name to Ames Fug, just because uh, apparently the people got tired of explaining what off Ugit was on their resumes. <laughs> my name is Viva Ugit. El Presidente. May I go next? Sure. sure. Uh, my name is Hakan Dran. This is my first lug meeting. I have been the, uh, you know, like lug member, I suppose, both in the email uh, list as well as the uh, uh, Slack, uh, you know, group. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, this is the first time that I'm actually joining live. Uh, and um, I, I, I don't have a technical background. I work at healthcare at the University of Iowa. Uh, I'm a physician actually helping people to get pregnant and make babies, you know. Uh, I'm a Linux enthusiast, essentially. Uh, uh, just like Andrew uh, mentioned, uh, like at night when I have some time, I 
tinker around, uh, you know, small bash scripts or Python scripts and, you know, things of that sort and break things and then try to fix them uh, and then break them again, you know, uh, that kind of cycle. And uh, it's just uh, nice to uh, learn from you all and uh, happy to be here. Welcome. Uh, I'd also like to remind anyone who isn't talking to make sure to mute your uh, uh, microphone so we don't end up with uh, your standard stereotypical uh, phone call where everyone's all clacking and uh, breathing. Thank you for the note. All right, uh, if there is anyone else who wants to chime in, otherwise we can uh, plow ahead to the news here. No, I've been a member only for about a few decades. Nice, when'd you start? The last millennium. <laughs> I'm just asking because the group that we're with started out in 1995 and I think we're one of the oldest lugs that's can still going that never had like a disruption so no. i think we officially started in 1997 and dan joined us i'll turn my video just because don was complaining but, oh not bad so, that's that's impressive um so we started in 97 and i think dan arthur joined us shortly thereafter and we haven't been able to get rid of him since not that we'd want to dan nice all right well then uh, a little bit of housekeeping stuff here uh, if there's no one else who wants to chime in okay uh, so as you can probably tell we uh, meet the third Wednesday of the month uh, for right now it's going to be online until either people stop uh, running into each other and uh, uh, causing trouble and spreading uh, COVID everywhere or uh, until DMAC opens back up and we can actually uh, meet in person somewhere again. I'm not sure which is going to happen first. Uh, so uh, when we're not in meetings, uh, the best spot to figure out where we are going to be meeting is the uh, website, which is CIALUG.org. Also, I usually blast it out to the email list, and there's usually at least a few of us hanging out on IRC and Slack. We have a bridge in between them, so uh, if you post in one, you'll uh, eventually make it to the other, and people chat back and forth. Uh, mostly the Slack is to get around uh, corporate firewalls and all sorts of other fun shenanigans like that. And uh, for future presentations coming up, I just jotted down a few of the stuff that uh, sort of was hitting the, the radar here. Um, Jitsi has been uh, talked about a little bit, and also WireGuard has been recommended. If there's anyone who either one knows a lot about these or uh, and would like to present or wants to find out about it, uh, I'm definitely entertaining people who want to talk for next month. Uh, and if uh, uh, you don't, otherwise I'll come up with something to uh, uh, say about them uh, next month here after I get unpacked and uh, moved in. Uh, usually before we go on to the uh, feature presentation, we talk a little bit about uh, the news of the Linux world. Uh, I'm uh, pulling some uh, uh, strings today to talk about things. Uh, the first uh, sort of big one in the, the Winix world of things, uh, apparently WSL2 is the Windows subsystem for uh, Linux uh, 2 is going to be or has just become generally available. So uh, now instead of being uh, Wine-esque, it's a full-on semi-VM. Uh, Looks like uh, in other news, the Linux uh, kernel is getting ready for larger CPU uh, microcode sizes. Right now, the uh, page size is 4K. 
Uh, apparently, they're upping it to 12K because AMD is going to be having some uh, new CPUs that are going to be uh, over that 4K limit and will be breaking everything, apparently. So, uh, not really a big deal, but uh, some cool upgrades there. Uh, weird article I found, I'll post it to the IRC uh, later, is uh, apparently someone figured out how to jailbreak their iPhone to run Linux on it. Probably going to void your warranty doing that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Linux uh, uh, 5.8, the uh, uh, kernel 5.8 is uh, going to have uh, auto detection for sound uh, wire, which is apparently some uh, Intel new uh, sound system sort of thing. I don't really know very much about it. I it seems interesting for especially for like mobile devices uh, so that will apparently is now stable enough that you can uh, run it uh, there are patches to the fat file system that are coming uh, so not only can you do the uh, the, the large fat files but uh, coming hopefully in the, the uh, kernel 5.8 uh, They've now fixed it, so one test that apparently used to take 383 seconds to run now runs in uh, 51 seconds. So if you're trying to bridge the gap between uh, Linux and Windows or you have a bunch of thumb drives sitting around, maybe things will go a little faster for uh, those edge cases. Uh, it allows you to better tune things. Uh, Let's see, uh, Microsoft has a new uh, Linux uh, policy in integrated policy enforcement uh, security module that will apparently let you restrict what uh, uh, executables you run. Uh, it's really not meant for, oh, we have another person. Um, so it's not really for uh, public use, uh, general purpose use, but it, sort of, it seemed reading into it a bit like super IPsec. So it, uh, uh, you can restrict down a lot better, uh, but I mean, it's Microsoft, so it must be at least partially evil. Uh, and uh, Linux kernel 5.6 is coming up soon. It will have WireGuard baked in, USB 4, some new GPU support, and uh, also apparently supports the Amazon Echo speaker if you want to run that with a Linux kernel. Uh, they've, uh, they're releasing soon uh, GNU Make uh, 4.3, which has some real cool speed ups. And then also in the video conferencing world, uh, Jitsi, uh, meet.jitsi apparently has a new end-to-end uh, -end, uh, encryption proof of concept. It's definitely not time for uh, ready for prime time. Uh, there's a lot of ugly bits, but it may actually uh, match what Zoom was uh, claiming to be end-to-end -end all the time, except for they're actually doing it. The biggest trick is how to share uh, your uh, keys out of band to make sure that uh, just anyone can't uh, join in the end-to-end -end, uh, fun. And then also there's a whole bunch of conferences and summits that are either canceling or going to uh, online only free status. Uh, Red Hat Summit is one of them. They just announced, uh, I think, right about when our last meeting was that it will be a free virtual event April 28th through the 29th and so if you want to have a little bit of free continuing education that's a great way to do it because otherwise normally you're out a couple thousand bucks and have to travel I know DockerCon has done a similar thing uh, and pretty much everyone else out there is following suit so if there's a cool conference that you've never been to and you want to this is your year Um, Quick side note on conferences. I, was, I definitely recommend yeah. you try to, uh, anyone. I there is a virtual conference aspect. You get to see the talks. Um, but if you ever ask someone like Jason or I, like who've been to enough conferences, there's a certain thing about being there. So if you're gonna judge based on you know on just content alone, 
Um, just know there's a whole part that you won't see on virtual conferences before you like try to see if you want to like go in the future kind of thing. Um, there's a personal aspect and birds of a feather. I don't think will happen, which are like impromptu talks that people have had um, that they have in person that I don't think will carry over the virtual conferences. Sorry for that little uh, derail. Oh, no, no, that's perfectly fine. I completely agree with you. I've been to several conferences through the years and the the conversations and also the sort of random after the the presentation chats that take place are by far the best part of the conference. Also, the uh, the conversations that take place while you're drinking beer at for free at the, the conference mixers really are what make conferences worthwhile but unfortunately no one's traveling right now and uh here we are so it's going to be a new world i'm really curious what uh is going to happen here over the next uh, couple of years uh now that people realize hey we can host these online and it's a lot cheaper will people number one be willing to pay for that uh, couple thousand dollar trip or also, will your employers be willing to pony up for uh, travel as well? Are they can, the two big uh, questions? I can tell you right now, Southeast Linux Fest, the minute this is, uh, virus is gone, will be online, and they do focus on a hallway track is what we call it. Uh, cool. Yeah, uh, feel free to share the, the uh, links. And uh, very worst case, I mean, there are a bunch of conferences that will post their videos out there uh, of presentations after the conference is over. So even if you can't travel all the time, there there are plenty of options out there for uh, uh, seeing really cool stuff out there. And now uh, with that note, uh, I'm going the wrong direction here. Uh, we're on to the, uh, the featured uh, presentation here from Will. And uh, I'll go ahead and uh, let him uh, take over sharing the screen here, and I'll uh, happily get out of the way here. And let me get the share. Got to find the right window. There, I think that's the one. Share. All right, is that the proper one? Can everyone see my screen all right? Yep. Yes. All right, cool. All right, so um, I've been doing, uh, or I just got to start with the project when uh, Jason uh, Plum, my co-presenter here, um, he originally got me roped into working on Arch Linux ARM, and he uh, last year was like, for, South, uh, for Southeast Linux Fest, he's like, hey, there's this new thing in beta for running Kubernetes, and it's supposed to work great on ARM. Let's do a talk about it. I'm like, cool. I, I, I had some exposure with uh, Red Hat OpenShift um, at my uh, company that uh, was something that left a lot of questions afterwards. And um, there were some things that were colorful, at least to say that wasn't the best experience. Um, but Jason comes along and goes, okay, let's, let's do this talk. I'm like, cool. He goes, it's in beta. It's just been announced. I'm like, oh yeah, cool. I'm excited. And, um, we started working on this project called, uh, or was it that we called Buzzcrate, uh, based on, uh, Rancher, uh, K3s. And, uh, Jason's, uh, been working on, uh, helping out GitLab, uh, move from a, uh, monolith to a microservices architecture. Um, you know, what was it with, uh, you know, GitLab. And from that exposure, we were trying to make, you know, just something that's really cool, works with ARM, and kind of show that you can play with Kubernetes, you know, with minimal resources and that it can actually be fairly easy and not just some giant enterprise tool for, like, you know, the basement. Um, but with that, uh, I will, Jason and I have also kind of been in, in a situation where when we got started, we could never find the, the beginner concept talk on how to start um, getting involved and understanding what's actually going on with Kubernetes. Like you can watch videos and there's just a bunch of buzzwords and it just kind of doesn't really make sense. So after uh, last month, um, I uh, proposed to talk on doing a talk on Kubernetes after impromptu showing off how to use Ansible to deploy a cluster. And uh, well, here's the tail end uh, of that talk kind of going more into of what is Kubernetes um, with uh, my co-presenter, Jason Plum. Jason, you have any uh, intro words for yourself at all? 
Uh, no, I think you sufficiently covered the fact that you're a schmuck and took on a project that you never knew was going to be this big. Uh, well, you also said you're going to help me and we're gone for six weeks out of the eight weeks that we had to have crunch time to get it done. Yeah, so, I mean, I had a job to do. Yeah, so did I. It's just you decided to fly and you, you were barely in contact, so thanks, buddy. Anyway, hey. but hey, but that goes to show you what happens, you know? It, the best way to learn is, going, is jumping off the deep end, pro promising everyone you're going to have a presentation, you know, for an audience more than just a couple people you know, and uh, yeah, you push to deliver, and uh, we did while telling Rancher that, you know, what's going on in beta testing things when they didn't think ARM was an important platform at the time. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, quick side reference of, I've been traveling around the world with this. It's a little stack of ARM devices. Yes, even the router. Uh, I think it's, actually, no, that one might be, a, might be a MIPS instead of an ARM. But that's a walk and talk and portable Kubernetes cluster that can be put together for around $500. And this is the basis through some of what we've done in this previous work with Buzzcrete. And what we'll cover today is the core concept of what actually makes this thing a thing, but also really what are those things and how do they really work? Yep. So, uh, basic you know what is kubernetes we just talked about it you saw a cluster but really what does it do um it's kind of like a all-in-one connecting multiple either virtual machines or bare metal system of making a cluster that just runs a container that gets passed around so it's going to provide you networking um if you need to scale up that's called replication it provides that does the load balancing to make sure that no hardware is like you know overloaded and making sure the performance is there as much as possible highly available you lose a node assuming you have the rest of the uh, uh, the rest of the resources handled it'll just reprioritize where you know container is going to be and run um, it also because of it, how it tries to do load balancing you can make it more performant um, I know in some instances, Kubernetes can be used for replacing uh, regular HPC systems. So if you need to have like a batch system for running a bunch of jobs, as most high performance computing is done, you can mimic a lot of that with Kubernetes without spending uh, over $200,000 for a scheduler, if you wish. Um, it gets a little weird. Uh, Multi-node microservices engine, that's the main use for it. Um, when you start breaking up uh, what they call monoliths, like instead of like having all applications in like, let's say a virtual machine and then just using parts of it for different parts of the application, you can literally just break it up into containers and Kubernetes will just manage it, assuming you have the rest of the setup done properly. And it can house data, or it can host databases and it can run storage uh, natively on the platform. However, there are some inherent problems with it and it may not be the best recommendation for a production application, but for some testing purposes, it can do it. Jason, do you want to chime in on any of that for storage or database questions? Yeah, storage and database are really tied together. Um, the simple answer is yes, it's capable of doing it, but before you do it and before you dare put a production workload on it, you need to understand how the platform actually works. And when I say platform, I really mean a gigantic stack of things on which all of your applications run. And therefore, as we all know, when you have complex systems, intricacies can bite you if you're not paying attention. It's amazing how much that one ant you stepped on can bring a few dozen friends really fast. <clears throat> okay, uh, so Kubernetes, container engine, or was, so the question is, what's a container? So slide three, um, there's kind of a graphical representation of what goes in a container, which is you have a, the base kernels from the host. Everything on top of it is in the container. Um, what would be in the container image would be like Apache, Emacs. Um, there's some writable stuff. And then the writable containers of like the, the, the transparent stuff on top is stuff that is either going to be environmental specific that you put in that at the launch of a container or something at runtime that runs there. And occasionally, if you have it set up, uh, a small amount of persistent volume storage for certain configurations that may happen or that may need to be set or cached uh, on a local drive at the time. Um, Jason, anything else missing from that? No, that pretty much covers it. The, the biggest thing is what you're really looking at is you have a base, 
and then you have a layer on top of that that's read only and another layer and it's just a, these, these containers are really just stacks of these layers until you get to the point where you go and actually operate and that's where that writable shim comes in think pixie booting but much smaller less resource intensive kind of like a vm but it only uses like the libraries that get called up there in the container and that's it namespaces is a big key, uh, key part of that too um so Containers, how do you build them? Well, you've seen Docker pull, that kind of stuff. Uh, really just look at the left side of the screen here. On um, the right side is from a script from our Buzzcrate, which the very last slide has a link to our GitLab if you wanna look at that locally at the time. Um, really left side is just, we do, was it? We mount, or was it, we started a container from scratch, which is literally an empty container. If you launch it, it does nothing. Uh, we have a little, mount small is just a, uh, in that case, we're just mounting like uh, where the file is located. And then it's just dumping the files you would have for um, like an ISO to build kind of like uh, a change root, shroot, chroot, however you want to call it. We dump the files in there. And then if we need to do anything else, uh, like any type of setup internally, you just do a run. And this would be the equivalent of like a small Docker run command. Copy over and in this, uh, you know, second last line, copying over a binary for one of the examples that we'll be running literally just in there and then unmount it. And the rest of it is you know, just data over here. And then the commit is the same as saying write or create like an ISO, but it's creating the image. Once it's created, it can go to an image repository. In which case if Docker uh, speak, if you're familiar, it'd be like doing a Docker pull from like some image. Well, this is how you write it. And then you just go put this in like, let's say, Docker Hub or Git, uh, GitLab also has a container repository, which you can have linked to your repo and so there's things you can do with automated builds and publishing, that kind of stuff. But both of them are valid. Uh, most of the stuff you're going to have publicly available is using Docker Hub or a mirror or uh, built locally system of like uh, of a Docker uh, registry someplace just to pull from. Um, all right. Kubernetes terms. Uh, we'll just go over these really brief because uh, we're just going to be using this. Um, most yeah, talks. Let me, let me interject real quick. Please. If, if he's going to go talking about the terms related to the ecosystem, let's start with the term itself. Kubernetes is a Greek word. And it actually comes out to be a descriptor in, in regards to a fleet or a navigator in this particular case, the way it works out to be the word when translated to English. The idea is that it's a system designed to coordinate everything to make sure that it all arrives where it needs to be at the right time. So managing that ship full of containers. It's the same root word as cybernetic. Yeah, it's not very far, yeah. <clears throat> all right, um, so also, the, it, the irony between all this is that it started from uh, Google, and there's a lot of people who own boats and love talking about, or, and it was launched when America's Cup was being hosted in San Francisco. So the nautical theme should not be lost on anyone, just given the time and the people. Um, so some terms that you're going to be hearing a lot, the most particular ones you need to know are, what is a node? A uh, node is like a virtual machine or bare metal. It is anything that will run pods. Pods are compute units, but it's just a fancy way of saying containers are, it's a container that gets run on nodes. Um, the reason why they're called pods is because they can have multiple containers and we have an infographic showing that later. Um, but the biggest thing is if you say that you wanna have uh, like one core or even like fractions of a core, it is not per container, it is per a pod. Also with the pod is where you would actually try to attach networking, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, was it, uh, Jason, did I miss anything about pods that should be noted as you're snickering? Thanks for the mute. Yeah, it's <laughs> like the toggle doesn't work when you're not on the window. That's not a very useful hotkey there, Zoom. Anyways, the, yeah, it's pretty much that. You, a pod is really a unit of work. Inside of that unit of work, you would often have more than one process container generally runs one process. So a pod can have 
multiple mounts, multiple containers. It's a way to orchestrate a, that unit of work and where it may end up to get done. Yep. <clears throat> Finally, uh, we actually have the container that we've talked about and, and we've already covered that. Um, but when you talk about container, that's the image and what you get launched. The container, uh, the container runtime is pretty much what launches and actually runs the container itself. Like if you do Docker, whatever, Docker would be a runtime. On our particular uh, cluster that we'll be doing uh, demo on, it'll be container D, if you're curious. Uh, container registry, uh, it's just a fancy way of saying I'm pulling one, uh, it's like a repository and like a repository for like Ubuntu or for whatever your distro of choice is. There's like a master one for the entire distro and you have to pull something, uh, you have to pull it and cache it locally, which is uh, something that every node has is like a local cache of it to actually run <laughs> the container on every node. Um, there's, it, if you get dive into it a little bit, uh, it, it does mean that every container that you are running is somehow replicated from someplace else that it's pulling from, which is something that you need to account for with storage, with getting up, uh, set up with uh, the containers. Um, cube control, that's just a uh, command line that we use for controlling it. Uh, there's a uh, API for it that other applications can access it for actually maintaining and for uh, setting up and just doing administrative work on a uh, container, or sorry, on, a, uh, con um, on Kubernetes, the orchestrator. Uh, load balancer, I think HA proxy, but moving containers around. Namespaces, uh, the best way that you can have multiple people running multiple projects without stepping on each other's toes is with uh, the use of namespaces, which is just saying, I gave this user rights to a namespace for a project, which limits the amount of compute, storage, and other resources that can have with it, if you want to set it up that way. Or at the very least, when someone goes to refresh a uh, storage, uh, or sorry, refresh a uh, project, they can actually wipe out based on namespace and not try to go through for every you know, deployment. Daemon sets and replica sets, uh, those are ways of saying, I want to run one pod or one project, but I want one on each node. Uh, something that would be doing that is something like Fluent D, which would be passing your log forwarding um, from you know, your each node to like a centralized spot. So if you have uh, Elk or Splunk and you wanna be able to look through whatever your application's doing, you can have it log based on each node uh, which every applicate or every uh, pod on every node can would be going and let's say dumping into like either uh, var log or it'll be like in general CTL and that way you can parse and index and figure out what's going on. Rule based access controls that's administration and rules that you can you, that's normally applied for either users and or applications for security purposes of how much access they want to have for uh, each part of the cluster. Uh, <clears throat> ingress and service. Uh, Ingress is basically means how do you get in the cluster? Just because you have a pod running uh, doesn't mean that it's going to be able to be uh, accessed from the outside world. Um, we'll get into the networking a little bit then. Uh, each networking, or how the networking either going externally or internally from pod to pod use service calls for that. And we'll talk about that briefly but it's a key thing to say that when I have two pods that aren't talking to each other, the first thing you're gonna look at is, let's say, the service file. With networking itself, we aren't, or most people don't use Kubernetes and actually have pods talking to each other directly through a regular network or what we call uh, a, a, a native network interface. They use software-defined networking. The two big ones I would recommend looking into if you're really interested is Flannel and Calico. There are a lot of options. You can get lost there, but those are two of the leaders. Flannel's easy, and what we'll be using, Calico is what a lot of the bigger uh, cust or what a lot of the bigger installs and the more professional installs use, which is a little bit easier to maintain and also supports things that are going to be convenient for certain environments, such as IPv6. At CD, very important for when you have a multiple master Kubernetes installation. It is the way that it is a what they call a key value store. It is a way for multiple for multiple masters to pass data from e each other in a timely manner without stepping on each other's toes. If you read into it, the uh, replicate uh, the algorithm that they use for it is really fun to watch when it's animated and quite possibly one of the best high availability uh, systems I've ever seen. Um, 
talking about storage, NFS, works great in small volumes. Jason's got a wonderful story about why NFS sucks for certain things like supplying uh, storage for Git for tens of thousands of people on a single node and then trying to scale up to over a million users. Worth uh, worth a discussion at some point if someone's got a question later on, hint, hint. Uh, persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. <laughs> when you use storage in Kubernetes, it's not just I want to I want some storage someplace and just go. No, there's a always a driver with it. If it's if it's local NFS, something like Gluster, whatever you want, you have to say I want I'm going to do something with storage. So you have to declare it, and then you actually have to get the volume there that's going to be provisioned that actually is the storage itself. One does not mean the other, and you can get into a funky state if you don't understand those two. And many storage implementations implemented on Kubernetes have fa uh, failed because they don't understand that when they go to implement it as professionals. I have stories about ClusterFS with OpenShift that I would love to talk about at some point. Deployments. Um, deployments, config maps, secrets, labels, and annotations are all attributes or setup files or kind of like use case, uh, or sorry, like a per use of like uh, of a essentially a YAML file that you set up or something that you do on the command line for setting up pods, that kind of stuff. Deployments are for saying, I have a project I want to deploy. It'll grab the image, deploy it, that kind of stuff. We have an example. We'll be going through that later. Config maps. Config maps are, imagine if you were using uh, a Docker uh, or, or any type of container and you're trying to use it like a function. Well, when you go to use it like a function, you need to pass it parameters. Well, the parameters that you pass it is through a config map unless you need to have them uh, hashed out so they're a little bit more secure then you would call them secrets. Um, secrets are you know, like just secure. Labels and annotations, those are more for nodes themselves. So let's say you have a big application that's running like blockchain. Well, the parts that are actually interfacing and need, let's say GPU, excessive uh, CPU or have high IO needs, you would put that and just say blockchain server or blockchain node. And with that annotation, we can have a pod that'll say, I'm only going to run on blockchain nodes. So that way, if let's say you have a Raspberry Pi in the mix, the Raspberry Pi is not gonna be trying to do blockchain and the end result is or hopefully will be your entire application that needs that piece will still move as well as you can possibly um, on the cluster. And then finally, GitLab CI CD. I have not been able to implement any other CI CD with the Kubernetes cluster at all, as well as I have with uh, GitLab. And uh, because they have some native integrations with it, I really recommend if you're playing with clusters and you need to talk about it, um, shoot Jason an email. If you need to uh, have questions, shoot me a message, IRC, whatever. I'm happy to answer them and it's made stupidly simple. And maybe a future talk, don't know yet. I haven't gotten that far yet. <clears throat> um, that pretty much covers that. And let's go talk about pods. Jason, you want to cover that? Sure. So as I said earlier, we're, this is a better explanation with visuals for exactly what a pod actually is. So we have four here. The first one, pod one on the left, is just a pod that has nothing other than a container. Consider this as like run busy box that the only thing it does is every time it receives a connection, respond, hello, and then shut the connection off. Then we go look at the next one here, pod two. This is something that actually has some amount of actual storage involved. So whether that's it stashing something or you preloading it data somehow, it could be any number of things. But let's say I stand up a MinIO server. I want to be able to make sure that my data is still going to be there in the event that the process restarts. I don't want to lose my data. So I'll mount a volume so we can actually have something to read and write from. Then we go into pod three. We'll go into something else. We'll go into say a web application that's serving some files out, but the little container beside it, what we want that to be doing is paying attention to the metrics. You know, you don't want your actual process that's doing your serving necessarily handling, oh, okay, let me count that one and that one and that one and that one. That's where you would run a, what they call a sidecar container that runs within the same pod and monitors the main process to see how the performance is going. 
That way you can check in on it later and know the difference between what's happening in pod three and what's happening in pod 35 and why one is getting more load. You it's have also information about it. It's also a great way if you have to worry about an SSL cert for, let's say, a web server, instead of baking it in your main um, container that you have with everything else with the web server that you need, this way you can put a sidecar and actually do the certificate validation off of it and then just route it to your pod that's doing the web serving or running up some small application that needs a cert. That's one way. And then, of course, on the fourth one, we have a, a much more complicated pod. This one has, you know, primary service, probably a side of some kind, another one doing metrics. You've got, we can't say whether those volumes are attached to one or more of the containers that actually are running, but this is usually when you have something like a, an API service. It doesn't actually do anything in the outside world, but it's got a little bit of data it's keeping for a local cache, and it's got another container that is actually giving it access to the rest of the outside world, possibly outside of the cluster itself, and then a little monitoring sidecar beside it. This is more of a complete application workload in pod number four. So you can then take this one and go, I need to have 15 of these because I know that in 15 minutes, I'm going to have an extra 100 people show up for work today, and I need to be able to carry the load. At the end of the day, so you know what, I'm going to just scale these back down. I really only need one overnight. So let me bring that back down and I know everything's going to keep running. By the way, at any point, if anyone has a question, feel free to chime in. What is a sidecar? A sidecar is a way to express something that runs beside another container. So think of a sidecar literally like the sidecar on a motorcycle, right? The person doing the work is on the bike doing the steering and the person in the sidecar is there as a ride along. Their job is to help navigate, you know, just keep the dog in the car, that kind of thing. Is it like a daemon? It's not necessarily like a daemon. Rarely do you actually run full blown daemons inside of containers inside of a cluster. Um, when you do do that, you have something like the daemon sets that we spoke of previously. It's more like another process that runs beside the process you have without actually sharing the file system. You tend to see a lot of sidecars as a debugging procedure sometimes, because if you make a container that's really lean, it's not uncommon to throw a sidecar in there to help out with uh, just you know, even something like giving it like, hey, I need to have a shell that can poke around, you know, in the file system. Okay, and the sidecars tend to run in their own containers then inside the pod? Yes, they are almost always separate containers. Um, as I said earlier, usually each container runs one process rather than, say, two or even three. You can technically start up a container that has many, many processes in it, but the idea with doing it in the way that Kubernetes has laid it out, you have the main process or processes, each in their dedicated containers. So you only have to worry about packaging those individual applications. And then the sidecar comes along beside that as well. Uh, question, if you don't like NFS, how do you share that volume between the containers? There are many, many ways to do it. Um, but generally speaking, I would actually say, unless you actually have a very good reason to share a read-write partition across a half a dozen machines in a data center, you shouldn't be doing it in a container either. Now, that being said, yes, classic example on a system administrator's viewpoint would be, well, what about all my home directories? Yeah, that's good until everybody in your home directory is running five databases several web servers and deciding that they're going to do indexing across 30,000 files per second. Okay, so, so you're saying instead of sharing the storage, you share the service like a database. You got one database container and everybody talks to it. Generally, that's what you want to do is you want to have concentrated access. So okay. you can do NFS, you can, and especially in small low scale processes, it actually works okay. If you're doing read only, then NFS can be useful in that regard. 
Uh, but you want to make sure that you're trying to concentrate that somewhere before going outside of the cluster. One of the better ways to do it is um, if you if you have like a smaller cluster, uh, is you have a service for doing handling your storage, and then there are certain storage nodes. And we'll get into the architecture very shortly to kind of show some of the things I learned when working with OpenShift, um, where in the end the storage is on is tied to certain servers. And you would have something like Gluster try to have a client that would try to reach out and do the load balancing, that kind of stuff. But in the end, it was still tied to some hard disk. What they, uh, what a lot of people try to do is for optimized storage for microservices is use uh, object data stores. So when you're in the cloud uh, or when you're in, in AWS, uh, you would use something traditionally like, a, uh, sorry, S3. And then they've mimicked some of those interfaces on, for storage teams to provide a service, such as using Ceph which can mimic that S3 bucket um, uh, type of uh, feel. And that way you can just mount and just say, here's something, here's a store in the object data store that I want to you know, use for these pods. And it just mounts based on an interface that's in the end just kind of recognizes just some networking storage uh, driver. But it's still done better than NFS's uh, imp implementation. Okay, well, well, I was thinking like if you've got 10, you got a microservice that's serving a website, you have to share that, you know, serve that data from somewhere. And typically you want that data in persistent storage so you can go out and tweak that without affecting your running containers. That's like, a, you know, a Docker installation. Does that work the same way in, with pods or is there a different, different tool? That actually is fairly common. Um, it all depends like I said earlier, are you preloading data? Are you doing read only? That kind of thing. Yeah, I uh, read only from the container. Yeah, read only from the container. It's not, I, I need you to understand that technically the Docker containers are the kinds of individual containers that a pod then has within itself. The thing is that if you have one container, this isn't a problem. If you have three containers, this isn't a problem. But what happens when you have 500? That's the, the level of scale. That's when you start to hit those edge points. At a certain scale, NFS will actually fall over because you haven't de dedicated enough CPU, you haven't allocated enough kernel cache, you haven't necessarily realized the amount of actual traffic that NFS raw actually is. There's any number of little hiccups that you can actually get. Okay. Okay, onward. So now that we've talked about, you know, the pods and how the containers are there, let's take a look at, uh, you know, what the nodes are. Um, by the way, uh, thank you for the recommendation for Dia. Uh, I don't think I would sit here and try to make any of these diagrams without anything, without prior knowledge uh, other than Dia. So thank you, CIA log. Um, so a basic representation of what we're, what's going on with a node is like, it'd be a system, either a VM, bare metal, I recommend not having virtual machines, hosting virtual machines to do this. Um, but so what you would have is like, you know, whatever compute unit would be there. So you would have your bootloader, you know, like your, your hard, anything that would connect to whatever hardware, virtual or physical. And then right after your, your base install of an, uh, of an operating system, you would have your container runtime in your container registry or, and what I mean by registry also is a local cache. So you may have a master registry that has all the different, everything that goes on that gets built for a system. Uh, the container cache is what Kubernetes is going to load in from every node to say, oh, look, I have uh, the bestest Flask, uh, was the bestest uh, Flask application. Well, if it's not in the local cache, it's going to go outside to wherever it's going to be lo uh, hosted, um, usually with your, uh, you know, either like uh, Docker Hub or GitLab or insert whatever, um, it'll pull it there locally. And then uh, uh, the, uh, the container runtime will go, okay, cool, I'm gonna run it. But you don't run containers in terms of like Docker run normally, you let the Kubernetes agent interface with the, uh, uh, or yeah, the Kubernetes agent to interface with the container runtime to run them in a special way. Um, if you have more questions, uh, that is something that Jason can talk about because he literally made a little flag that kind of was a jumpstart for Kubernetes. Um, 
in terms of uh, fixing a networking problem locally uh, that led to people building clusters. <clears throat> so once you have the container run, there's going to be networking because a lot of the stuff is, you know, network focused and for connecting to different nodes and figuring out what's going to be exposed or not. So you're going to have to network to all those nodes or those other pods, wherever they are on node, wherever is uh, with the software defined network. And that's where flannel, calico, insert, you know, whatever option is going to be there is going to connect. So uh, you're going to hear like, you know, the phrase cedar. Uh, <clears throat> I can't remember what it spells out. It's C-I-D-R. Um, it's something classic. Right? Say that one more time. Classless interdomain routing. Bing. Thank you. Cider routing? Yep. I call it cedar, but anyway, um, it is cider, yes. And so that's instead of having that defined on for all the pods to talk to, and that way you don't have to have like a class B just to put up a single uh, Kubernetes uh, installation, you still make sure that there aren't any type of networking uh, conflicts for that uh, within an organization. But ideally, because you're using software defined networking, it won't interface with anything outside the cluster um you know with the use of or because it's not a it doesn't have like a flannel or calico or whatever agent um then we're talking about like the the replica sets or the daemon sets where one on each node those would be persistent on every node so i just have four of them rep, uh here uh it's not uncommon to make sure that at least something called fluent d is implemented which goes to some central log storage for information and you can set up what's going to be logged and what's not and that way it'll actually go from every node to one spot um anything that you would need to check for monitoring of the node health is also in there so like metric beat that kind of stuff is all would all be like daemon sets on or replica sets on every node possible and this is kind of important for when you go to clear them out because they want to stay there <clears throat> after that then we'll actually have applications and this is some sample ones. Uh, so like a namespace that I would have uh, would be, you know, the na namey namespace. I have no idea what it does, but it's going to do something with compute where it's going to be crunching numbers. And then it's going to try to talk to each other with some like MQ service, like rabbit MQ or zero MQ insert, whatever. Um, namespaces are key here because if you want to, let's say, delete those name, uh, everything related to that namespace, you can do that. And this way, uh, another application right next to it, another that has that has nothing to do with it, and just sharing hardware. Let's say bestest namespace. Um, that application can just run, and you can just uh, th that way. There's like another software uh, separation between the two for what's running on hardware. And then there's the most important part, since uh, every node can run all these different containers, and there's all this the container runtime is there. The Kubernetes agent will use more resources than it has available unless you define some reservations for the system. And when you start getting above that, you start hitting the OOM killer and you may lose uh, such services on each node as SSH, the actual Kubernetes agent. You may start dropping pods left and right. You never know. It's a it's wheel of fortune what you hit there unless you hit certain permissions or you just say, you know, the last 200 megs, that's going to be system that we're going to leave that alone. And you can also put reservations on, on uh, processing to make sure you're not oversubscribed on a node and running into a situation where you just drop stuff. Uh, Jason has some wonderful tales. Uh, I don't know how much of them he can talk about, but they are entertaining to say the least. Well, they've, um, they've all been discussed before, but quintessentially, uh, imagine you take a system that was decently sized and then decided to throw an entire 500 person company at it. You to say you're going to see some stuff fall over in weird ways. Now imagine doing that when you have a whole bunch of little processes running and you decided to uh, hammer it at 10 times the load it could sustain and tell it to try and just create more processes when it couldn't get its work done. Uh, needless to say things went sideways. Your cloud providers may have fun. Part of the reason why we stress the fact that networking, particularly NFS, is a problem is that Jason has experienced play, dealing with a network, uh, a storage problem that was network attached, where you try to make, where if you have a lot of uh, I.O., a lot of that I.O. turns into not only data being passed, but the number of connections, which means there's a limit at some point. 
uh, that the cloud provider will put in. And at first it starts throttling by making Go slower. And then if you have certain things that check out to make sure that the, it's, it's uh, talking fast enough, like if it doesn't see a response fast enough, it goes, oh, I lost a packet, I'm just gonna go send it again. And next thing you know, you have a giant mess and you have no idea how your cloud provider is gonna help you out. And that's where you can turn NFS from a storage problem into a network problem. And then when you literally have uh, NFS, it turns into three problems or any other storage solution with that uh, as well. Um, going back up here. Uh, I think that covers it all for a note. I'm trying to think of anything else is standing out. Yeah, we oh, can move on. one last thing. Uh, with annotations, let's say if you have a GPU, you can put a GPU annotation here, and that means one of the pods here could be, or it would, it would only service or, or allow pods that are that need GPU for let's say blockchain is a one that's actually coming up. Or if you have an FPGA that's helping out with artificial intelligence, that is where you would tie it to each node. Something that everyone has seen that runs Kubernetes that uses these specific annotations is your Toyota Prius is actually running Kubernetes. And for where the application needs to run within that network of systems, it uses node annotations to make sure the run load is on the proper, you know, where it has the proper, or where it's supposed to run the proper spot and have the proper IO to perform the functions that it needs to. All right, that's it for nodes. All right, so I talked about OpenShift and one of the things that kind of is scary about OpenShift that may turn into as much as $1.2 million spent on um, consulting for a cluster or two and you never actually see make it to production is the result of this terrible architecture. And unfortunately, this is what you're gonna see when you go to deploy what Red Hat recommends with persistent storage, a base cluster. And it means, and it's kind of confusing. So I used Microsoft Paint level D of skills here to show kind of like what a base cluster is actually recommended. Um, so Kubernetes as a whole, and I'm talking about implementing it on VMs or implementing on virtual machines, or sorry, uh, virtual machines or bare metal, that if you have multiple masters, you need to have them talk with at CD. Now, if you're using something like CoreOS, this entire architecture just kind of goes out the window because things get strange. Um, but generally speaking, you have a, you have etcd, which is that key value store for all the masters to talk to each other. So if one drops, it makes sure that old data, when a, when a node comes back online, doesn't change in what's going, uh, doesn't change what the, uh, what the masters are doing. So the entire cluster can work when a master drops. The masters are sitting there doing load balancing and routing, uh, or in assisting in the routing between the workers, the storage, and the infrastructure nodes. So the word ingress, well, that this line over here is what ingress is. That's how you get in the cluster, and that's how this gets attached to the worker nodes. Um, with Red Hat, they rec prescribe this as this is the minimum viable solution. You can have all the masters you want for free. You can have all the infrastructure nodes you want for free. Storage, you add certain chunks you have to pay for, but you pay for every worker node in OpenShift, 3x that is, um, for, that makes it available for compute. And it doesn't matter what size the compute nodes are in terms of like hardware capabilities. I don't care if you have 64 cores or two cores, you pay the same amount for each worker node. So uh, that's just something that's been noted and just something when you go to look at it. And as a contrast for what's all uh, out in the uh, workforce, uh, Rancher doesn't have such limitations, which is quite nice. Anyway, so this is OpenShift in a nutshell, what they're trying to sell you, which they're trying to get set up. There's a lot of moving pieces. It's an Ansible playbook, which if you guys saw last month, we deployed our cluster in like five minutes. This takes on fantastic provisioned bare metal or, or well-tuned virtual machines about two hours to run and is finicky on OpenShift 3X to deploy. Um, going into, oh, and raw Kubernetes, they recommend something like this, but it, there's more leniency for how the setup is because you don't have prescribed uh, vendor uh, provided uh, Ansible scripts to uh, use it or to deploy it. K3 Buzzcrate, we make it very simple. So it's literally just one master. Um, as of uh, sometime at KubeCon in December, 1.0 was released for general acceptance where they did start supporting multiple masters. It's still not reliable, but if you're running one master, 
that instead of etcd being complicated, key value store, SQLite. Workers, you can keep on adding them, no problem. Storage, you can just do an NFS mount outside if you need to, um, it'll work. And then ingress nodes, well, you can do that directly from the pods because a lot of uh, Kubernetes has a lot of this stuff built into it. And that is actually just the simplicity of Buzzcrate as a whole. Jason, am I missing anything for either one? No, primarily Buzzcrate, the entire intent is to make it smaller and lighter than running full-blown Kubernetes. Um, wherever you get your storage from, whether it be NFS, local storage, running MinIO somewhere, or you can even run a couple of the cloud native storage ones if you want to. It's, they're not bringing that for you basically. So pick and choose what you want to add on. And one other aspect is uh, one of the parts of the appeal of building this cluster is a developer laptop can cost up to two grand to try to run a small cluster on it. And even then, most people don't. They try to run something like Hypercube, which is just one simulated node of Kubernetes. But I'm sure we have enough sysadmins in, uh, on the call tonight that understand that node-to-node uh, -node networking um, can be a bear, and there could be some gremlins that developers and testing miss. So for less than the cop of, uh, cost of a crappy laptop, you know, more than a Chromebook, you can have a cluster to spin up and just test basic things, which for something like uh, Python or Node.js, uh, you really don't need that much hardware most of the time um, to test out. Uh, you're, you're good luck though when it comes to Java because it's a bit the RAM restrictions of a lot of uh, um, hardware or of a lot of ARM hardware right now makes it a little bit cost prohibitive or just impossible to get access to the hardware that can run it. And uh, finally, if people want to go to gitlab.com slash buzzcrate, uh, we're actually going to be diving into the cluster that, uh, which was, uh, the example was built previously. Um, and we're actually going to play around with it. Uh, Jason has access to the, uh, to the cluster and I'm switching over to a um, command prompt to play around and show everyone how awesome playing with a cluster is and fun. And this is where, uh, you know, if you have any questions or if you want to see us break things in new ways, we're doing it. Um, so let me switch over to sh stop that share. And all right, assuming everyone can see that, I'll try to make it a little bit bigger. So this is a for everybody. Yeah, that can see it. Yeah. All right, cool. So just to prove that there's actually a cluster here, we're going to use the first command. And uh, after the talk, during the talk, if there's any questions about what commands are being used, um, I have no problem answering it because I tend to forget a lot myself. And it's just after a while, you start using it, it just becomes second nature. Um, so kubectl is what we're going to use. I've already run a command where I've actually linked myself to the cluster, so I don't have to be on the cluster to run it. Uh, Jason will take over the screen at some point and show you something called K9s, which we've implemented right out of the box uh, as of last night. But we're going to do get nodes, and we're going to do output for uh, wide. And what that is going to show is literally, whoop, let's make it a little smaller. All right. Apparently, Zoom did not like the size of terminal I was using. All right. So as we can see here, um, there are there's one master and four worker nodes. Shows you what kernel, and very important is the container runtime version. If that doesn't match up, things can get a little squirrely. Uh, right now, we're showing a bare cluster, and which means we need to start adding. Well, here let's do uh, cube ctl. And we're going to get pods-o wide, which shows us networking, what node it's on. And we want to make sure it's all namespaces. If there's any command I recommend learning for Kubernetes, it's this. And as we can see, completely bare. So first thing that we're going to install is a load balancer. 
uh, Jason, you want to chime in exactly what Metal LB does and what's the base system? You're a little bit more familiar than I am. Okay, so Metal LB is a project that effectively allows you to have a layer two load balancer available on your network. Um, you can do it through either layer two and it just assumes an IP address or do it through BGP if you have the routing chops and capability because many home labs don't necessarily have that. Um, it's nice, it works especially for small projects like we have here with these ARM clusters. It works in larger ones. I know of some people that have you know, a fleet and data center, they've got 15 machines running Metal LB behind their, their router on the rack and it works really well for them. Uh, effectively, you assign it a range and then when an ingress asks for, hey, I want a load balancer resource so that I can get my service to listen on an IP address that's outside of the cluster, uh, Metal LB watches for that request and then it hands out one of those addresses that it has access to. So you can put a flag on that to give it a reserved address or you can just say, you know what, just give me one, I don't care, give me from your default pool and it will hand you something in the default pool. Think of it like three clusters in HA and you have manually set up your router to say that all three of these machines answer an IP address. Except now you don't have to manually set your router up to do that. All right, Metal LB is launched and we see it's on every node. Now we're gonna go have a little bit of fun because I think some of the applications I'm about to apply are gonna break some stuff. Um, Jason, so, I'm thinking, let's go simple first, go Echo. Yeah, like the fact that Metal LB is a perfect example of a daemon set. So there was the asking before of like, you know, actually running daemon. You were, generally speaking, you're running one daemon per system. That's why it's called a daemon set is you aren't gonna run five copies of the Metal LB balancer across every single node that you have. You're gonna want one per node and you're gonna want it on every single node, therefore, Damon set. Yep. And uh, just to let you know, there are different ways also with how simple the system is without having like in, uh, infrastructure or our ingress design nodes. Um, for, per, for larger production systems, you would, it would be required um, to handle load balancing or at least more complicated Kubernetes uh, installations that would be like for multiple larger companies. Uh, sorry, for multiple business units in larger companies uh, would have it. But for this one, if you actually want to set up networking so it connects directly to, you know, each pod, you can. You can have it set up so it's load balanced all the way in. Um, we have an example where it's got some load balancing uh, with our basic one. Um, so if you follow along, uh, anything after the buzzing goes from our buzz crate repository and then the folder structure within it because this is literally checked out from Git. Uh, you have nearly all the settings I do. Um, if they, the, the delta between what I have on my local system, and what you see is very small for the alarm cluster, but I can definitely say for deploying the application, if you have Raspberry Pis, Odroid C2s, anything that you can run Arch Linux ARM and run a mainline kernel, uh, the deployments that you have, or the, everything we have in Buzzcrete for config buzz specifically, will deploy the cluster with very little intervention on your side to make sure that you get the names of the systems that you have correct. All right, after that, so we have Metal OB, so we're gonna go to my sample apps section. Now, the sample apps, this is where you would go to build, you know, your containers and that kind of stuff. Um, so Go Echo is, let's go to the Go code. The Go code is literally a really simple web server. If you've never touched Go, and you wanna like play around the basics, well, I think this is like what, 29 lines? Uh, I might be able to expose it then for us, depending on how sidetracked I get and how much I can focus. But literally, it's just going to be a little web server that it just responds with whatever you send it. Really basic. You compile it, and because this is on ARM, I have to compile it on ARM. That's already done and already uploaded to Docker Hub. So from there, we go to look at the, the – we would actually build the image – uh, which I posted in, uh, before. You go in the image folder, it's build to me. Um, we, you can look at that in your own time or ask questions later on, we can do that. But let's go to the K3s folder. K3s is where we're gonna do the deployments. And assuming you have a K3 
Kubernetes, it doesn't matter if it's K, uh, actual Kubernetes or if it's uh, K3s like we have, as long as it's ARM, these deployments will work. If you need me, if you need to re, uh, rebuild and you want to change like the name of the image for where you're going to host it, this should work on an x86 Kubernetes deployment too, or K3s. So a uh, quick little look at it. Um, we're going to look at the deployment for GoEcho and we're just going to do a very brief overview just to kind of get familiar. First thing we're going to do, that this is going to be multiple files in this one, in this particular uh, uh, file itself, is uh, our multiple configurations in one file. So there's just a definition of, we're going to set up the namespace scratch. Once we're in namespace scratch, we're going to do a deployment, which says kind deployment. And the key thing I want to show you here is we have image is literally what it's going to be on Docker Hub. If you don't put down anything, it will assume Docker Hub for the image unless there's something routing it on each container, uh, or sorry, in each node where to route for the container registry. And that will go over there and pull it to the app cache. Then it's just gonna, once it launches, or it's gonna launch the container with a command. For this one, it's just gonna be web server. And there's an argument that's gonna be put in there. So it's the same as putting and saying web server 8001 on your um, command prompt, which are uh, yeah, on your terminal, if you have it built and run locally. And then uh, we're gonna go down to the, oh, we are pinning the affinity. So instead of using load balancer, we're gonna say uh, worker one. We'll be playing with that so you can see it bounce around up here in a little bit. And then we have a service file. Service file is that networking that we were talking about. So what we're gonna do is we wanna have target port, which is gonna be internally where, how, if we have other pods, how is it gonna work? And we have to make sure that, that each pod exposes itself to the internal software defined network target port is that and then where it's going to go out to the world is that port number 81. Now by out to the world he means outside via the cluster this, no via this service yeah yeah okay so in this case we'll get to this in a second port 81 says when you try to talk to the service and you hit port 81 this is what i'm going to be listening for target port actually says this is the port on the destination of that pod behind me that I'm actually going to be sending the traffic to. Then when we actually get down to the bottom of this particular configuration of the service, the type load balancer, that's where it comes in where Will is saying out to the world because this service is going, hey, I'm a load balancer. Can I have an IP address? And that's where Metal LB steps in, hands it an IP address that's world reachable, and now it's actually exposed. So up above, I made it, instead of looking at all namespaces, we're just gonna look at the one pod, just, so, just to reduce the amount of noise on the screen. So you've seen the command just like before with the metal B, kubectl, you wanna apply. There's some application stuff that you can do on the command line, or we can make it simple and just say dash F for a file. And we want to do the go echo deploy. So it's going to create, and up here you can see automatically it's going to worker one, which we did pin a node uh, node affinity, and it's going to uh, when the, it says creating, the first thing it's going to do, it's going to go out to Docker Hub, it's going to download it and bring it in the local cache. Once it's in the local cache, then it's going to in the container runtime engine, it's going to be like, okay, go time, it's going to run it. The agent's going to assist it and try to work with the internal networking, which is Flannel, uh, the software defined networking, to get it set up. And then the load balancer will try to make sure that it uh, can come into the cluster properly as it's the service that's running. And that takes a moment. When you go to redeploy a container, if you, unless you have it set up to pull a fresh image every time, it will go faster the second time because it is cached. Just note, it's like a package in like Debian or like your uh, your Linux system from your distro. If they change the package, you may not actually get an update unless they've done something to increment the number by something or the value by something. And then it will download the latest available package. Otherwise, if you're just, if it's the same release, let's say like Go Echo Deploy 7 and you just update Go Echo Deploy 7, it's not going to do like a hash value to see if, if anything's changed. It's just going to be like, oh, the numbers are the same. I'm going to leave it alone. So there's a way to force it to download a fresh one every time. I think it's, uh, I think it's set image policy to always is something in the uh, deployment part. 
Anyway, yeah, we have this. You would you would do an item and then actually says image pull policy always because the default is if not present. Yeah, so kubectl service uh, and we're going to do oh sorry kubectl and we want to do a get service for names uh, namespace and it's going to be scratch. Uh, I think I'm screwing that up. CTL get multi type of service dash n. There we go. So we're going to see our load balancer here. Uh, so there's an external IP and uh, and so if I go to take a look at it and just do um, curl, I'm going to do 192.168.50.70 port 81. And we're just going to do this. And because of how it handles spaces, is a test bad request. What did I do wrong? Oh, I need some more 20s in there. Pro oh, yeah, you're right. Thank you, Chief. You're right. 20 CIA log. There. And if I have time, I'll actually expose it so you guys can all play with it if you really want to. Um, but there's basic Go code, and this is the basis for making a API in Go. So have at it. Um, there is a way to actually turn this into an IRC bot or Slack bot if people are very interested. <clears throat> um, so with that, uh, let's say we get lots of traffic and we want more nodes because that pod can't handle it. Well, you do, we're going to go look at the, the, what the deployments are. So you do kubectl get deployments for the namespace scratch. Oh, there, there's one called go echo. So if we can get deployments, we should be able to edit it. And uh, if you try to learn what kubectl is, it's kubectl, the action for the thing, name it, uh, the, the specific thing. And then if there's anything parameters like namespaces, you put that at the end um, and how you want to output it if you want, if you're doing like a, a get or a describe. <laughs> but let's see here, and we want go echo. So we should see a part of, after this metadata and after some of this information here, down here in the spec file, this is actually the deployment that we set up and actually sent to the system. Um, we can either edit that file that we had with like the web server uh, information and kind of tweak it to do to our how we want it to look and just push that new file or we can just edit it live and this will actually do a linting on the system to do an update so let's say if we want to so let's pretend we're having a lot of traffic when people say i want to scale well one of the easy ways with kubernetes to scale is we're going to replace this with the number three and if we watch up top because it's all pinned to one worker it's going to have three of those pods scaled up and we're online. So let's go verify the service to make sure that it's working as expected. So that means there's gonna be a load balancer on IP 170 port 81 that's gonna balance between all those pods. Well, we're pinned to one node. So how do you change the, the node affinity or how do you let the node load balancer properly load balance on the system? You delete the node affinity. So we're going to go back in the edit. And so, oh, every time it updates, it's going to give you a generation number. So it's something unique here. So that's something to watch out for. This is where we can put uh, up here, uh, we can see annotations for it. We can actually set the annotations by doing kubectl, edit, node, put the node name in there. We can put it so the, the labels for everything we need to. And there's a way to actually have the deployment go match labels and, or where you do exclusive or exclusive um, for certain labels if you want to for deployments. But besides going into that, and there has been some changes from the last time I've looked at this, the easiest way I found to pin node affinity is literally just to sort of say node name and what's there. So uh, we want the load balancer to go nuts. We're gonna go nuts. So the, when we do the load balancer, it's literally gonna delete almost everything. And what we're seeing here is also, if you were to do like a new deployment and you want to roll out new stuff, 
it'll actually wait until the new pods are loading before it'll terminate the old ones, which means for, in terms of like CI CD, Kubernetes already does that. Now, as you're seeing with these different nodes, and if you're just trying to use, let's say the most basic uh, version of uh, persistent volume storage where it's using local storage, if you have local service, uh, local storage defined for persistent volume claim, let's say on worker one, and you go and the load balancer goes to hit for, and it goes, gets started up on worker three, the persistent volume claim, it'll generate new on the other node, but it won't be the same data. So this is kind of highlighting, or this is highlighting, you know, a part of an issue with Kubernetes where if you try to use local storage, you may get bit if you don't watch it. But if you pin node affinity, you can get away with it for some basic testing. Um, that's just, you know, showing runtime, some of the storage problems. Anyway, so now we have load balancing and we should be able to pin it. And why is there that many pods? I don't remember setting up for six. And only one of them's on worker one. Huh, well, let's go take a, oh, Jason, were you messing with it in the background just to dick around with me? Ah, eh, there we go. Eh, you little prick. See generation four, I had generation two that I put in there. Jason had fun. So, and he's probably gonna change it on me again, just because he can. So if we go to three, boom, automatically I, scaling down. I'm also not bothering to actually edit the deployment itself. I'm just saying, hey, kube control scale replica six, deployment go echo. And yeah. poof, it mm -hmm. does what I told it. Yep. All right, cool. So that's one. Uh, let's go deploy another app. And by the way, if you have questions as we're doing this, now's the, we're going to have fun. And if you have dumb ideas, now's the time. Granted, I only have two apps to pull from right now. Unless someone has a basic one with uh, uh, multi-architecture support, then yeah, we can do that. Uh, so this is, uh, you can dive in the code. There's a Flask application and there's a uh, actual, um, uh, there's an actual uh, database that's being deployed with persistent volume storage. And I'll show you something that we're running into with our cluster right now, where it just goes into a, what we think is a kernel problem, but we'll show you what a failed system actually have or, and how to start and one of the debugging tips then for when something isn't working right. Um, usually it means code container creating. Oh, you're having fun again, aren't you? Good job. Uh, so we're going to go into K3s. And for me, I have a buzzcrate folder in here. Uh, Jason has one for uh, his Libra crate. And we're gonna do, first we're gonna deploy Flask cause that's got more stuff built into it, including the namespace, we need that. And then I separated the service file from the deployment file for Flask to show you separate files to deploy if you wish. So cube CTL apply dash F Postgres deployment. And up top, I was an idiot and forgot to change this to go to the new namespace, crud. And then Jason will pass over the screen over to him and he can show you what K9s looks like if you want a very nice interface so you don't have to remember half these commands to just say, I want to look at the thing. So that's going to uh, create. And while that's going on, you don't need to do one at a time. Uh, I need to go tab. Uh, keeps it all apply dash F you want the flask deployment followed by flask service. And we're going to do a watch on cube CTL get service dash N crud. And then we can actually watch that pop up. Now, right now it should work fine. And uh, so we see a little bit how the networking is supposed to go and I can go test it out over here in a moment um, while that's booting up. But let's go watch the actual deployment itself. So we're gonna do a cube CTL get events for namespace crud. And we're gonna put a dash W so all the new lines just get stacked right underneath it. You can watch it live as it gets brought up. This is the command that you would use for when you're watching when a pod has a problem. And we'll be doing that in a moment to show how things can fail horribly. 
because of the multi-node problem that we're having it, that's only experienced on Arch and a show that, well, no one's going to be planning to use K3s on, in production on ARM hardware until uh, some questions are answered first. It works great on Ubuntu, and it's not a distro problem. It is a kernel config problem to the best of our ability that we can understand of it. We've lined it up, we've matched it, and we're scratching our heads. And uh, when we're told use a sane kernel, and you show the person that told you that the config for building it, and they have no answer, well, there, there you have it. And we're up and running. And as you can see, the status was changed down below. And we're golden. <clears throat> now, if we want to cause something to fail, there's an issue where if I move the Flask application, we should start seeing that event log start failing. And we'll start seeing it kind of have issues where it's just going to start reloading pods, which is a key sign to say, I need to check my events. So we're going to do a cube ctl edit deployment i believe it is flask dash n crud if not we'll go take a look all right so we're going to do a get deployments first and i said flash so that's probably a problem and i screwed up my up there okay so over here, let's change the node affinity to, let's say, worker two. I mean, let the load balancer do it, but it's better to have a little bit of control over it. All right, so as we see, it's gonna try to do its load balance thing from one to another. And you can tell what's going on. So when it says pulling, it's pulling from the repository in the local cache. And that's pretty much it. If you want to see what's happening in the pod during loading, well, that's a little bit difficult. One of the tricks that I learned <laughs> hours before we went to present at uh, Southeast Linux Fest and where we discovered the multi-node problem was to kind of put a pause in there and just kind of get a bash shell to go directly in. Oh, tail chase variables, you can, Arthur. Um, it doesn't work the best, and there's some stuff built in with uh, some of the watch commands for that. Uh, why container D instead of run C, uh, JT? It's because it's built in. Sorry, I'm getting caught up on the uh, questions. Thank you for handling that, Jason, by the way. Send out variables and watch commands. Um, more or less, and Jason will show you the alternative with K9s in just a moment. So let's get this failing here. So it's going to see, say it's going to continue pulling. Oh, and just to make life a little bit more fun, let's create a new one, kubectl. So if you want to delete a pod, just because you can, um, kubectl, delete, pod, grab the name. Dash n before the namespace, and it'll start deleting it pretty much immediately. If you want to kind of kick things up a bit, and it's going to try to reload itself. So notice that the one on worker four came back and that kind of stuff, and it's trying to use the load balancer, or sorry, it's trying to use like its uh, its replica controller in order to say, okay, I've renewed the last thing that's there before going on to a new data variable set, which is actually something kind of new to Kubernetes. Before it would just kind of go nuts and change nodes and stuff, but we should be seeing it fail. And as we can see here, it says warning failed. It says cannot find volume. It can't find the volume because it can't connect to the Postgres pod that has the information. And this is kind of... No. The default token is definitely not the Postgres pod problem. But there's no, there's no persistent storage for the Flask. Yeah, this is the default token, like the thing that Kubernetes mounts in for the service account default token. Mm. The node is having a problem in getting a piece of information from the master. Oh, fun. Oh, 
but it also shows that it doesn't happen unless we go to a different node. Right. So it's a node problem. It's kind of related. Yeah. Doesn't but it's gonna, on my cluster. And here's the, yeah, I know. Thank you. Cause you're running Ubuntu on that, Mr. I'm an Arch Linux arm uh, core developer. Hey, I have built in from scratch my own distributions for work before. I will use what I choose to use for what I choose to use it for. I'm just trying to make you look good. It's only been a year. Bug, bug request or bug noted. All right. Um, so uh, yeah, so as you see, it's just going to sit there failing. And that's pretty much it. Uh, it. Uh, so if there's anything that people want to have, the demo gods demand blood. Okay. Well, we're having fail here. Um, let me kick that over. Jason, do you want to show off K9s and start playing around and really trying to break things, screw with things, and have some fun? Sure. I'll need you to stop share so I can put mine up. On it. While that's happening, I'm going to see if I can publish uh, the uh, a working application so people can actually hit it from their homes. Okay. So I am just connected into his cluster. I'm sitting on the master node. Uh, and I'm going to just give you a quick example of how these actually work. So he's deployed a deployment, right? So he could control, create deployment, and it does its thing. Well, mysteriously in the background, there's more than that going on. He's showing you the pods, but when I go down into K9S, I can actually go look at the replica sets. And here he actually has his active replica set from the last time we made a change to the deployment. If I go in here, these are all the pods that are back from that. If I were to actually look at this, you'll see the owner reference saying it's from the deployment from GoEcho. The point I wanna have with the pods is what I've done up here is just pull up all the pods, figure out which ones are on what worker and everybody's favorite off twick. Just gonna pass that right in. The replica set's job of the deployer is to make sure that the number of pods that it's supposed to have actually exist and are operational. So when we said, you know, give it eight replicas to the deployment, it actually creates a replica set, and then it's the replica set's job to make sure that there's that many pods up. The pods don't have any smarts. They're not the ones restarting. The replica set is going, hey, I only see seven. I need eight. Give me another one. So if, if I go ahead and just delete a random two of them after I actually set the namespace... We'll see it actually get rid of those two pods and you'll see them almost instantaneously get terminated and then get new containers creating. That is actually the job of the replica set. That's what they do. The deployment is a way to define a workload through the pod and the containers that are inside that pod and then it will then turn around and create the replica set and manage the versions of that, which will then make sure that all of your pods are up to date and actually functioning. Yeah, let me go ahead and boop, off away that goes. So K9S is really handy when, uh, let me pull up the chat so I can see it. There we go. Scroll to the bottom and everybody hears the whine of the wheel. Okay, so here I am just looking at pods. I can actually turn around and look at those services because remember we were talking about the load balancer, right? So this is the service itself. If I do a describe on this, so I'm gonna hit D real quick. This is the service that we declared. It is in the namespace, this is its name, and you can see that it's type load balancer. The Load balancer IP address is obviously different from its own IP address. This is the public one where we could reach it from outside of the cluster if anybody could reach that address, right? But this is the internal address of the service. So if I were anywhere else in the cluster, I could actually go, hey, I want to talk to GoEcho and then 
look that up by DNS, that would actually give me the internal address. And then I could talk to anything behind that service by DNS name. So let's go ahead and find a pod. Uh, let's see, you are in CRUD, right? There we are. We're in CRUD, Postgres. If I remember right, Postgres has a shell. Leave. No busy box inside that one. Eh. And this is where you can start treating some of the pods like mini VMs kind of light, but. I, I want you to stop using the word VMs. They really are, containers really, really are just really, really fancy shrews. We're isolating the processes, we're isolating the network into individual devices off of the kernel, but there's no VM overhead. You're, you're not actually emulating hardware, you're not got five copies of the kernel. The containers actually share kernel. They don't share kernel space because it's namespaced and they can't touch each other, but they're sharing the execution time within the kernel. And a lot of people, yes, it is. it can be described as like a VM, but it's not a VM by a long shot. Let's see here. Actually, you know what? Let me just do this and grab. Nah, just end. One of the handy things that Kubernetes actually does is for all of your containers, it actually exports all of the other services and container ports that you've declared. So remember on that service where we said it was port 80 go, or port 81 goes to port 8001, right? In this particular case, inside of CRUD, we have the Flask container and we have the Postgres container. So we can actually look at the declared Postgres port and the declared Flask port, right? So if I wanted to actually connect to the Flask pod, then I can actually turn around and just directly curl the thing. Although I missed a digit in my copy because how would IO work? Oh, well, I don't even have curl. Great. I thought I did. And you don't have any flask running. The flask is in a separate pod. Oh, indeed, I'm in the wrong namespace. So you're right. Yeah. Nope, that right. one has BusyBox in it. There we are. I was in the wrong namespace view. Eh. Pop of the flask. By the way, while you were talking, Jason and I exposed the uh, ports to my router for port forwarding, and people can hey. actually play the basic apps. Hooray! See? Hey. This isn't just voodoo magic on a screen. Although, don't wow. trust her. <laughs> when grep isn't there, and you're like, oh, where'd it go? All right, so as I was trying to do, seriously, your container doesn't actually have curl like you told me it did. Uh, do BusyBox curl. It doesn't have the soft links. You got to install the soft links first. Oh, applet not found. Oh, weird. Okay, I'm sorry. Where is the good old Alp? I haven't used WGET in so long. Uh, you grabbed it, now cat it. Oh, I actually had to manually do that? Eh. Uh, Jason, Jason, if you go to the uh, if you go to the browser, by the way, uh, you can actually connect to it. I, if you look in the chat, I actually have uh, two links connecting directly to it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, I, I get that. That's not what oh, I'm okay. trying to do. Remember, I'm trying to show inside of the cluster. Oh, sorry. Right. So we have the Flask port. We had a service, right? There we go. See? There's that. Now, if I do BusyBox... Netstat... Say LNTB... 
I'm locally listening on port 6550, not 6555. But what I just actually pulled down was off 6555, right? That's the example of by going to the service, you'll end up at whatever pod behind it can actually serve as the answer at that time. So I can actually curl directly to localhost or w get it into cat, right? But the example is I can be on any pod in the network and I can hit anywhere inside of it and that service acts as a kind of blind load balancer. It doesn't necessarily know anything about the application or the routes you're trying to reach, if it's an HTTP API or something like that. All it knows is I have eight pods and seven of them say they're ready. So I will send you to that one. That's its job. Now, if I remember right, you're in the username CRUD, right? Or user namespace CRUD. So yeah. if we have the service is Flask, right? So Correct. I should be able to do busybox wget. Um, let's see here. It's going to be. Uh, do you need the port number? Nope. Flask.crud.cluster.local. Try to remember the name spacing for that, you know. It is indeed. Okay. That's what I want. So if I do a busybox wget flask dot that and port six five five five. Watch it make a fool out of me because it's a web service and it's trying to it doesn't know how to respond. It's W get is going to ask for like index. And you see, some of us even have hard times hitting these things. because Sometimes we just forget how the names stack together. This is one of those things where it's so complicated. You're surprised it worked at all. Last word, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Yeah, the name is Flask. Namespace. I don't normally have to do this by hand on the name. That's why my brain's like, what's going on? Am I running as root in this container? You should be. Hey. Handy dandy tools. Based on the, the prompt there, you should. Say that again? Uh, based on the fact that you, you've got an octothorpe there, uh, and your root at uh, Flask, you should be uh, root. Oh, no. I'm just not accustomed to having a container actually running anything as root. So <laughs> my brain's like, oh, hey, I have root. Why does this not work? I haven't a clue. So those who thought the uh, demo gods needed blood, we found it. Services, go to all. Okay, can't get a shell in there. Smart pants, and I don't have 
any logs. Yo, that's not useful. I anyway. was trying to go to, to Kube DNS, which actually runs and maintains a DNS specifically for the contents of your cluster. Mm. And seeing what the logs show up as. So I could actually try and hit the right one, but it used to work. I remember when you did that for debugging itself, and I think they changed how something's done on the cluster with one of the later revisions of K3s. Yeah, more than likely they just changed something. So, did you have something to actually have me do? Nope. Play around, show K9s, show how nice interfaces, so that way they don't have to see all these crazy commands that you need to have. Yeah. I could be jumping around and going like, okay, I know I had a service. Let me go find it, right? That's where I am at this point is show me all the services and I'm currently in namespace all. So I'm like, show me all the services on all the namespaces, but I could be very specific and like, okay, show me all the services in CRUD. Um, uh, Arthur had a, uh, had a thing where it's just said name, lookup, test, flask.crud. in the chat. No, no, I see it in the chat. Hmm. Does crud <laughs> show up for anything? Service. Well, that would be why I couldn't get anywhere. Yeah, that would explain a lot. <laughs> hey, look, we found out what happened to the DNS. <laughs> Nothing. Regardless, the fact that this all runs underneath my TV right now is pretty awesome and fits in a shoebox. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean... And these are things that you may run into. And part of the reason why I like demoing out an entire solution and not just say some emulated environment like hypercube is that these are issues you may run into in production or just playing around that you don't experience with just a simulation of a cluster on a single node wasn't it a chick-fil-a that had a uh, uh basically at each of their restaurants a stack of nuts that they were running uh, Kubernetes on? Yes. Uh, and Walmart and several other companies. There's literally Priuses driving around with Kubernetes on them now. Um, there are ships at sea completely run by large Kubernetes clusters. Most newer Seawolf uh, subs are running, have been upgraded to running Kubernetes on it. Actually, yeah. I bet you I know what happened. Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, hey. Your networking problems. Look at that. I don't see it. <laughs> okay. Worker 4 does not like me. Give me all the pods from all the namespaces. Find me something on master one. I can move go echo to master one. I have one. Okay. okay. Give me a shell here. So anyway. First things first. Yep. So uh, yeah, Kubernetes is becoming more and more ubiquitous and it's just a matter of time. I think before organizations start playing with it, uh, there's a reason why man, obviously you see some of the, how complex it is. And there's a reason why managed services with cloud services have stuff like Fargate, EKS, GKS, that kind of stuff um, as a solution because administrative wise getting the setup is a lot. Uh, I think it's a little bit easier than OpenStack, but not by much just because there's more moving components that are kind of, abstracted that it runs upon or run, uh, runs uh, runs across for uh, other services. Like they're literally trying to deploy Kubernetes on top of agents for system functions um, for many flavors of Kubernetes based on the vendor. Um, but because of that, uh, they've also made it really simple. So if you ever have 
if you ever have a complicated system where you need to have it tied to specific hardware, and if you want to have it span across large regions, um, Kubernetes can start answering those questions. And they actually have a Kubernetes cluster, more or less, to run other Kubernetes clusters called Istio. So no matter where you are in the world, you have different regions, that kind of stuff. It all gets funneled to the proper services and regionally uh, serviced. Yeah, DR, I'm definitely, I see where you're coming from with your immediate comments. Uh, in this case, I have just demonstrated the broken network that Will keeps running into. Uh, this doesn't happen on my cluster and we really do need to dig a little bit deeper and find out what it is that is preventing this uh, because it literally never happens for me. Um, as you can see, I managed to sort the DNS by going to a node that can actually talk to the DNS server. Uh, unfortunately, now I'm on a node that can't talk to the other node, so therefore eh, I can't actually reach the pod that is trying to reach, which is very annoying. All right, and so I think that's pretty much all we have for the presentation because we've been going on for a while, but I hope everyone got to see the sacrificial gods. You got to see hands on, and if you're on IRC or something like that, oh, shut up, JT. Um, <laughs> I'm watching yeah, no, that. This chat. is not Dev. No, moving on. <laughs> so I, I was waiting was for someone a, to say a that. Question about uh, there was a question about Helm. Uh, a little bit earlier that uh, they were, I'm trying to scroll back through the, the log here to find it. Uh, that was uh, me. Yes, uh, if there's any time left, can you talk about Helm? What is it and are there any good charts to try out on K3S? I'm going to hit stop share. Um, um, so for Helm, yes, there are charts. There are plenty of basic ones. Uh, do they work on K3S? The answer is uh, some of them are, and they're getting better because if it's a really basic like web server Helm chart that they have, or a really basic app, which there are plenty that do exist. I don't have specific examples, I apologize. Um, a lot of the containers that are built up and how they work with Docker are set up for multi uh, architecture um, containers. Let me interject. K3S is built for multiple different architectures. The problem that you may run into are charts, Helm charts, that are using Kubernetes definitions that include, I want to use this Docker container, and then that Docker container is not using a multi-architecture manifest, meaning that when you specify that container and tag by name, it's only built for x86-64. At which point you try to run it on our machine and it just goes, uh, yeah, wrong exec format, go away. Uh, which could happen if we tried to build some of the containers that Will has and ran them on x86-64, but didn't use the, the multi-architecture manifest. Um, I am using K3S on a regular basis as part of my testing for my day job um, because I actually spend... 90% of my day in Kubernetes Helm and containers. Um, I'm a distribution engineer for GitLab, uh, and I am one of the maintainers for our Helm charts, which is insane because it, our Helm chart is actually like 19 in one. So yeah, there are plenty of ones that are out there. Um, to use any of them, the biggest trick is you want to make sure that you set something up um, Let's see here. Oops, long UI. You want to make sure you have something set up to do storage provisioning, whether that is the local path provisioner that comes now as a part of K3S or something else. In case you have a pod that has persistence, it's going to want to be able to get a disk. So if you set up a VM with, you know, four CPU and eight gig of RAM, which by the way is more than big enough for most things. You can get away with two and even four to six gigs of RAM to do some real play um, when you're using K9S or K3S versus a full-blown Rancher Kubernetes engine. As long as you have something that can fulfill the needs, which is a uh, load balancer provider and a 
storage provisioner, you can pretty much play with any chart out there in the entire Helm repository. So for those not knowing what I'm talking about, if you go to, um, I believe it's helm.sh. I've got too many windows. I'm checking right now. Yes, helm.sh. Helm.sh. So Helm is, is kind of like a package manager for Kubernetes. The intent is that you have a way to get cleanly defined version definitions of all of these little YAML objects you keep passing around, right? The other thing that it does is gives, gives you a way to version those as well as do some templating on those so you can turn, turn certain features on and off. Um, for the simple ones like, you know, deploy me a WordPress. It's literally, give me an ingress, give me a database, and give me three application pods. That's effectively what they do. It's like, hey, please give me my SQL. Please let my SQL have a disk. Can I have an ingress, please? And I want to have three to start with. And then it will, when you do Helm install, it will actually go and create all of those resources in a versioned way. And then when you do Helm upgrade, it won't forcibly change anything that it doesn't actually need to change. So if all you're doing is changing the default username on the actual PHP pods, then it's only going to touch the PHP pod. It's not going to restart your MySQL container as an example. Um, but say you did go to do an upgrade and you went from, you know, version one to version 2.5 or 2.50 because they work in, in semantic versioning. You go from MySQL 4 to MySQL 5 or even if you're crazy 6, then it's actually going to be like, okay, well, I'm not changing the application pods right now unless my code base has changed, so I'm not going to touch this. But I do have to restart your database. And then it's going to go, oop, let me go restart this. Does that serve for uh, some explanation of what Helm is and some of the yeah, things? Yeah, yeah. I was just looking for like a way to, like if I was spinning up a cluster, I just want to like get something up and running quickly without having to, like you said, uh, deal with a whole bunch of YAML. I mean, I know at some point that's unavoidable, but just to sort of just get off the ground, it seems like, hey, let's just spin up a Helm chart and just do a WordPress just to sort of get off the ground. So what I ran across with this project is um, when we started off with working with ARM, there wasn't a lot of Kubernetes support for ARM. And there a lot of applications weren't there. So if you have any smaller projects that you have, um, and the, the projects I have are pretty well defined for just getting started up on a small cluster if you want, um, uh, through the uh, gitlab.com uh, slash buzzcrate. If you go to the sample apps, I would work on making a Helm chart for those because those should be fairly simple overall to start playing with, try to deploy. Because um, right off the bat, you're going to be playing with um, Helm. Uh, sorry, right off the bat, you're going to be playing with YAML, I mean, um, the minute you start touching a Kubernetes cluster. Right. But as I said, if you can start up a VM, whether it's on DigitalOcean or and your, you know, your laptop or a tower you have floating around the house, then it's something you can just jump right into because 95% of the time, whatever the container is, is going to be built for x86-64. Uh, what are the ARM uh, uh, hardware that you guys are using a lot? Are you just using Raspberry Pis or are you using like more specialized ARM hardware? The exact bill of materials is actually found. If you go to the uh, gitlab.com slash buzzcrate, there's a project called Details. Um, there is a... Uh, uh, a readme or there's a uh, markup for the Libra crate and then there's an actual spreadsheet with all the costs and links that I used at the time for building uh, what we call a hard crate. So you can literally go through, click through and buy all the parts and uh, we'll be updating that in the future as I go to include CI CD for building and deploying to the cluster from gitlab.com. Okay, thanks Will. Right, so as he said, there's a complete bill of materials. We have links to all the parts, how much they were at the time, and the estimated cost coming out of it, if you want to build off of these. 
Uh, yeah, I have a huge a huge amount of junk x86 hardware, but uh, I do like to play around with ARM too, so I'll check it out. Right. Any other questions? Well, if there, there aren't any more, uh, thank you guys for presenting. And uh, the rate we're going, it looks like we'll be uh, stuck here in virtual land again uh, for next month. Uh, and for that matter, I, I mean, it's gone well enough. Uh, who knows if we'll ever leave uh, the, the virtual land here, uh, the rate we're going. Uh, or just hack on but, another meeting a month. A virtual one versus the in-person one. Or there's possibility of hybrids or whatever ends up happening. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, next month, uh, if there aren't any uh, volunteers on stuff, it probably will end up being uh, uh, a networking uh, sort of fun with uh, uh, trying to get, uh, oh, what was it here? Uh, trying to get uh, the uh, VPN uh, stuff for throwing a total blank. It's been a long day. Uh, VPN working for whatever that was that Dan, Don, you had asked for. Uh, uh, WireGuard. Uh, so it will be a WireGuard uh, attempt at making WireGuard play nice. Uh, and are you uh, talking to me right now? Yes, I was. Okay, sorry. I'm I'm following multiple meetings at the same time. No, that's perfectly okay. I was just saying next month I was going to make an, a swing and attempt at uh, making WireGuard work. To uh, since you'd asked about it. Good. The good news is it's it's actually quite easy. So that's good. Uh, but yeah, so we've hit that uh, time of the night where we usually end up going to go get uh, uh, beverages and uh, provisions at a local establishment. Uh, due to uh, the current uh, state of affairs and uh, the disaster declaration that isn't going to happen tonight. So if you have a uh, frozen pizza, go ahead and throw it in your uh, own oven and uh, we'll uh, unite uh, separately uh, for the after party. I think uh, Walt already pre-gamed a bit and I think that's why you had to drop early. <laughs> well, uh, off camera, I was uh, pre-gaming a little as well. That matched the background anyway, for a moment. Very well done. <laughs> Thank you again for uh, presenting, and uh, uh, we'll meet everyone in uh, IRC land and uh, on the, the emailing list uh, until next uh, month. All right. Thank you. Catch you guys later.